Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by A.C. Benson, The Slipe House. In the town of Garchester, close to St. Peter's Church, and near the river, stood a dark old house called the Slipe House, from a narrow passage of that name that ran close to it, down to a bridge over the stream. The house showed a front of moldering and discolored stone to the street, pierced by small windows, like a monastery, and indeed, it was formerly inhabited by a college of priests who had served the church. It abutted at one angle upon the aisle of the church, and there was a casement window that looked out from a room in the house, formerly the infirmary, into the aisle. It had been so built that any priest that was sick might hear the mass from his bed without descending into the church. Behind the house lay a little garden, closely grown up with trees and tall weeds that ran down to the stream. In the wall that gave on the water was a small door that admitted to an old timbered bridge that crossed the stream and had a barred gate on the further side, which was rarely seen open, though if a man had watched attentively, he might sometimes have seen that a small, lean person, much bowed and with a halting gait, slip out very quietly about dusk and walk, with his eyes cast down, among the shadowy byways. The name of the man who thus dwelt in the Slipe House, as it appeared in the role of the Burgesses, was Anthony Purvis. He was of an ancient family and had inherited wealth. A word must be said of his childhood and youth. He was a sickly child, an only son, his father a man of substance, who lived very easily in the country. His mother had died when he was quite a child, and this sorrow had been borne very heavily by his father, who had loved her very tenderly, and after her death had become morose and sullen, withdrawing himself from all company and exercise, and brooding angrily over his loss, as though God had determined to vex him. He had never cared much for the child, who had been peevish and fretful, and the boy's presence had done but little to remind him of the wife he had lost, so that the child had lived alone, nourishing his own fancies, and reading much in a library of curious books that was in the house. The boy's health had been too tender for him to go to school, but when he was eighteen he seemed stronger, and his father had sent him to a university, more for the sake of being relieved of the boy's presence than for his good. And there, being unused to the society of his equals, he had been much flouted and despised for his feeble frame, till a certain bitter ambition sprang up in his mind like a poisonous flower, to gain power and make himself a name and he had determined that as he could not be loved, he might still be feared. So he bided his time in bitterness, making great progress in his studies. Then, when those days were over, he departed eagerly, and sought and obtained his father's leave to betake himself to a university of Italy, where he fell into somewhat evil hands. For he made a friendship with an old doctor of the college, who feared not God and thought ill of man, and spent all his time in dark researches into the evil secrets of nature, the study of poisons that have been enmity to the life of man, and many other hidden works of darkness, such as intercourse with spirits of evil, and the black influences that lie in wait for the soul, and he found Anthony an apt pupil. There he lived for some years till he was nearly thirty, seldom visiting his home, and writing but formal letters to his father, who supplied him gladly with a small revenue, so long as he kept apart and troubled him not. Then his father had died, and Anthony came home to take up his inheritance, which was a plentiful one. He sold his land, and visiting the town of Garchester, by chance, for it lay near his home, he had lighted upon the Slipe House, which lay very desolate and gloomy, and as he needed a large place for his instruments and devices, he had bought the house, and had now lived there for twenty years in great loneliness, but not ill content. To serve him he had none but a man and his wife, who were quiet and simple people, and asked no questions. The wife cooked his meals, and kept the rooms, where he slept in red, clean and neat. The man moved his machines for him, and arranged his files and instruments, having a light touch and a serviceable memory. The door of the house that gave on the street opened into a hall. To the right was a kitchen, and a pair of rooms where the man and his wife lived. On the left was a large room running through the house. The windows onto the street were walled up, and the windows at the back looked on the garden, the trees of which grew close to the casements, making the room dark, and in a breeze rustling their leaves or leafless branches against the panes. In this room Anthony had a furnace with bellows, the smoke of which discharged itself into the chimney, and here he did much of his work, making mechanical toys, as a clock to measure the speed of wind or water, a little chariot that ran a few yards by itself, 
a puppet that moved its arms and laughed, and other things that had whiled away his idle hours. The room was filled up with dark lumber, in a sort of order that would have looked to a stranger like disorder, but so that Anthony could lay his hand on all that he needed. From the hall, which was paved with stone, went up the stairs, very strong and broad, of massive oak, under which was a postern that gave on to the garden. On the floor above was a room where Anthony slept, which again had its windows to the street boarded up, for he was a light sleeper, and the morning sounds of the awakening city disturbed him. The room was hung with a dark arras, sprinkled with red flowers. He slept in a great bed with black curtains to shut out all light. The windows looked into the garden, but on the left of the bed, which stood with its head to the street, was an alcove, behind the hangings, containing the window that gave on to the church. On the same floor were three other rooms. In one of these, looking on the garden, Anthony had his meals. It was a plain paneled room. Next was a room where he read, filled with books, also looking on the garden, and next to that was a little room of which he alone held the key. This room he kept locked, and no one set foot in it but himself. There was one more room on this floor, set aside for a guest who never came, with a great bed and a press of oak, and that looked on the street. Above, there was a row of plain plastered rooms, in which stood furniture for which Anthony had no use, and many crates in which his machines and files came to him. This floor was seldom visited, except by the man, who sometimes came to put a box there, and the spiders had it to themselves, except for a little room where there stood an optic glass through which on clear nights Anthony sometimes looked at the moon and the stars, if there was any odd misadventure among them, such as an eclipse, or when a fiery-tailed comet went his way silently in the heavens, coming from none might say whence, and going none knew whither, on some strange errand of God. Anthony had but two friends who ever came to see him. One was an old physician who had ceased to practice his trade, which indeed was never abundant, and who would sometimes drink a glass of wine with Anthony, and engage in curious talk of men's bodies and diseases, or look at one of Anthony's toys. Anthony had come to know him by having called him in to cure an ailment, which needed a surgical knife, and that had made a kind of friendship between them. But Anthony had little need thereafter to consult him about his health, which indeed was now settled enough, though he had but little vigor, and he knew enough of drugs to cure himself when he was ill. The other friend was a foolish priest of the college, that made belief to be a student but was none, who thought Anthony a very wise and mighty person, and listened with an open mouth and eyes to all that he said or showed him. This priest, who was fond of wonders, had introduced himself to Anthony by making believe to borrow a volume of him, and then had grown proud of the acquaintance, and bragged greatly of it to his friends, mixing up much that was fanciful with a little that was true. But the result was that gossip spread wide about Anthony, and he was held in the town to be a very fearful person, who could do strange mischief if he had a mind to. Anthony never cared to walk abroad, for he was of a shy habit, and disliked to meet the eyes of his fellows. But if he did go about, men began to look curiously after him as he went by, shook their heads and talked together with dark pleasure, while children fled before his face and women feared him all of which pleased Anthony mightily, if the truth were told, for at the bottom of his restless and eager spirit lay a deep vanity unseen, like a lake in the woods. He hungered not indeed for fame, but for repute, monstrari digito, as the poet has put it, and he cared little in what repute he was held, so long as men thought him great and marvelous, and as he could not win renown by brave deeds and words, he was rejoiced to win it by keeping up a certain darkness and mystery about his ways and doings, and this was very dear to him, so that when the silly priest called him seer and wizard, he frowned and looked sideways, but he laughed in his heart and was glad. Now, when Anthony was near his fiftieth year, there fell on him a heaviness of spirit which daily increased upon him. He began to question of his end and what lay beyond. He had always made pretense to mock at religion, and had grown to believe that in death the soul was extinguished like a burnt-out flame. He began, too, to question of his life and what he had done. He had made a few toys, he had filled vacant hours, and he had gained an ugly kind of fame, and this was all. Was he so certain, he began to think, after all, that death was the end? Were there not, perhaps, in the vast house of God, rooms and chambers beyond that which any was set for a while to pace to and fro?
About this time he began to read in a Bible that had lain dusty and unopened on a shelf. It was his mother's book, and he found therein many tokens of her presence. Here was a verse underlined. At some gracious passages the page was much fingered and worn. In one place there were stains that looked like the mark of tears. Then again, in one page, there was a small tress of hair, golden hair, tied in a paper with a name across it, that seemed to be the name of a little sister of his mother's that had died as a child. And again there were a few withered flowers, like little sad ghosts, stuck through a paper on which was written his father's name, the name of the sad, harsh, silent man whom Anthony had feared with all his heart. Had those two, indeed, on some day of summer, walked to and fro, or sat in some woodland corner, whispering sweet words of love together? Anthony felt a sudden hunger of the heart for a woman's love, for tender words to soothe his sadness, for the laughter and kisses of children, and he began to ransack his mind for memories of his mother. He could remember being pressed to her heart one morning when she lay abed, with her fragrant hair falling about him. The worst was that he must bear his sorrow alone, for there were none to whom he could talk of such things. The doctor was as dry as an old bunch of herbs, and as for the priest, Anthony was ashamed to show anything but contempt and pride in his presence. For relief, he began to turn to a branch of his studies that he had long disused. This was a fearful commerce with the unseen spirits. Anthony could remember having practiced some experiments of this kind with the old Italian doctor, but he remembered them with a kind of disgust, for they seemed to him but a sort of deadly juggling, and such dark things as he had seen seemed like a dangerous sport with unclean and cultish beings, more brute-like than human. Yet now he read in his curious books with care, and studied the tales of necromancers, who had indeed seemed to have some power over the souls of men departed. But the old books gave him but little faith, and a kind of angry disgust at the things attempted, and he began to think that the horror in which such men as made these books abode was not more than the dark shadow cast on the mirror of the soul by their own desperate imaginings and timorous excursions. One day, a Sunday, he was strangely sad and heavy. He could settle to nothing, but threw book after book aside, and when he turned to some work of construction, his hand seemed to have lost its cunning. It was a gray and sullen day in October. A warm, wet wind came buffeting up from the west, and roared in the chimneys and eaves of the old house. The shrubs in the garden plucked themselves hither and thither, as though in pain. Anthony walked to and fro after his midday meal, which he had eaten hastily and without savor. At last, as though with a sudden resolution, he went to a secret cabinet and got out a key, and with it he went to the door of the little room that was ever locked. He stopped at the threshold for a while, looking hither and thither, and then he suddenly unlocked it and went in, closing and locking it behind him. The room was as dark as night, but Anthony, going softly, his hands before him, went to a corner and got a tinder box which lay there, and made a flame. A small dark room appeared, hung with a black tapestry. The window was heavily shuttered and curtained. In the center of the room stood what looked like a small altar, painted black. The floor was all bare, but with white marks upon it, half effaced. Anthony looked about the room, glancing sidelong, as though in some kind of doubt. His breath went and came quickly, and he looked paler than was his wont. Presently, as though reassured by the silence and calm of the place, he went to a tall press that stood in a corner, which he opened, and took from it certain things, a dish of metal, some small leathern bags, a large lump of chalk, and a book. He laid all but the chalk down on the altar, and then opening the book, read in it a little, and then he went with the chalk and drew certain marks upon the floor, first making a circle, which he went over again and again with anxious care. At times he went back and peeped into the book as though uncertain. Then he opened the bags, which seemed to hold certain kinds of powder, this dusty, that in grains. He ran them through his hands, then poured a little of each into his dish, and mixed them with his hands. Then he stopped and looked about him. Then he walked to a place in the wall on the further side of the altar from the door, and drew the heiress carefully aside, disclosing a little alcove in the wall. Into this he looked fearfully, as though he was afraid of what he might see. In the alcove, which was all in black, appeared a small shelf that stood but a little way out from the wall, 
Upon it, gleaming very white against the black, stood the skull of a man, and on either side of the skull were the bones of a man's hand. It looked to him, as he gazed on it with a sort of curious disgust, as though a dead man had come up to the surface of a black tide and was preparing presently to leap out. On either side stood two long silver candlesticks, very dark with disuse, but instead of holding candles, they were fitted at the top with flat metal dishes, and in these he poured some of his powders, mixing them as before with his fingers. Between the candlesticks and behind the skull was an old and dark picture, at which he gazed for a time, holding his taper on high. The picture represented a man fleeing in a kind of furious haste from a wood, his hands spread wide, and his eyes staring out of the picture. Behind him everywhere was the wood, above which was a star in the sky, and out of the wood leaned a strange, pale, horned thing, very dim. The horror of the man's face was skillfully painted, and Anthony felt a shudder pass through his veins. He knew not what the picture meant. It had been given to him by the old Italian, who had smiled a wicked smile when he gave it, and told him that it had a very great virtue. When Anthony had asked him of the subject of the picture, the old Italian had said, Oh, it is as it appears. He hath been where he ought not, and he hath seen something he doth not like. When Anthony would fain have known more, and especially what the thing was that leaned out of the wood, the old Italian smiled cruelly and said, Know you not? Well, you will know some day when you have seen him. And never a word more would he say. When Anthony had put all things in order, he opened the book at a certain place and laid it upon the altar, and then it seemed as though his courage failed him, for he drew the curtain again over the alcove, unlocked the door, set the tinderbox and candle back in their place, and softly left the room. He was very restless all the evening. He took down books from the shelves, turned them over, and put them back again. He addressed himself to some unfinished work, but soon threw it aside. He paced up and down, and spent a long time, with his hands clasped behind him, looking out into the desolate garden, where a still red sunset burnt behind the leafless trees. He was like a man who had made up his mind to a grave decision, and shrinks back upon the brink. When his food was served he could hardly touch it, and he drank no wine as his custom was to do, but only water, saying to himself that his head must be clear. But in the evening he went to his bedroom, and searched for something in a press there. He found at last what he was looking for, and unfolded a long black robe, looking gloomily upon it, as though it had aroused unwelcome thoughts. While he was pondering, he heard a hum of music behind the heiress. He put the robe down, and stepped through the hangings, and stood a while in a little oriel that looked down into the church. Vespers were proceeding. He saw the holy lights dimly through the dusty panes, and heard the low preluding of the organ. Then, solemn and slow, rose the sound of a chanted psalm on the air. He carefully unfastened the casement which opened inward, and unclosed it, standing for a while there to listen. While the air, fragrant with incense smoke, drew into the room along the vaulted roof. There were but few worshippers in the church, who stood below him. Two lights burnt stilly on the altar, and he saw distinctly the thin hands of the priest, who held a book close to his face. He had not set foot within a church for many years, and the sight and sound drew his mind back to his childhood days. At last with a sigh he put the window to very softly, and went into his study, where he made a pretense to read, till the hour came when he was wont to retire to his bed. He sent his servant away, but instead of lying down, he sat, looking upon a parchment, which he held in his hand, while the bells of the city slowly tolled out the creeping hours. At last, a few minutes before midnight, he rose from his place. The house was now all silent, and without the night was very still, as though all things slept tranquilly. He opened the press and took from it the black robe, and put it round him, so that it covered him from head to foot, and then gathered up the parchment and the key of the locked room, and went softly out, and so came to the door. This he undid with a kind of secret and awestruck haste, locking it behind him. Once inside the room, he wrestled a while with a strong aversion to what was in his mind to do, and stood for a moment, listening intently, as though he expected to hear some sound. 
except for the faint biting of some small creature in the wainscot. Then, with a swift motion, he took up the tinder box and made a light. He drew aside the curtain that hid the alcove. He put fire to the powder in the candlesticks, which at first sputtered, and then swiftly kindling, sent up a thick, smoky flame, fragrant with drugs, burning hotly and red. Then he came back to the altar, cast a swift glance round him to see that all was ready, put fire to the powder on the altar, and in a low and inward voice, began to recite words from the book and from the parchment which he held in his hand. Once or twice he glanced fearfully at the skull and the hands which gleamed luridly through the smoke. The figures in the picture wavered in the heat, and now the powders began to burn clear and throw up a steady light, and still he read, sometimes turning a page, until at last he made an end, and drawing something from a silver box which lay by the book, he dropped it in the flame, and looked straight before him to see what might befall. The thing that fell in the flame burned up brightly, with a little leaping of sparks, but soon it died down, and there was a long silence in the room, a breathless silence which, to Anthony's disordered mind, was not like the silence of emptiness, but such silence as may be heard when unseen things are crowding quietly to a closed door, expecting it to be opened, and as it were holding each other back. Suddenly, between him and the picture, appeared for a moment a pale light, as of moonlight, and then with a horror which words cannot attain to describe, Anthony saw a face hang in the air a few feet from him, that looked in his own eyes with a sort of intent fury, as though to spring upon him if he turned either to the right hand or to the left. His knees tottered beneath him, and a sweat of icy coldness sprang on his brow. There followed a sound like no sound that Anthony had ever dreamed of hearing, a sound that was near and yet remote, a sound that was low and yet charged with power, like the groaning of a voice in grievous pain and anger that strives to be free and yet is helpless. And then Anthony knew that he had indeed opened the door that looks onto the other world, and that a deadly thing that held him in enmity had looked out, his reeling brain still told him that he was safe where he was, but that he must not step or fall outside the circle. But how he should resist the power of the wicked face, he knew not. He tried to frame a prayer in his heart, but there swept such a fury of hatred across the face that he dared not. So he closed his eyes and stood dizzily waiting to fall, and knowing that if he fell, it was the end. Suddenly, as he stood with closed eyes, he felt the horror of the spell relax. He opened his eyes again, and saw that the face died out upon the air, becoming first white and then thin, like the husk that stands on a rush when a fly draws itself from its skin and floats away into the sunshine. Then there fell a low and sweet music upon the air, like a concert of flutes and harps, very far away. And then suddenly, in a sweet, clear radiance, the face of his mother, as she lived in his mind, appeared in the space, and looked at him with a kind of heavenly love, then beside the face appeared two thin hands which seemed to wave a blessing towards him, which flowed like healing into his soul. The relief from the horror and the flood of tenderness that came into his heart made him reckless. The tears came into his eyes, not in a rising film, but a flood hot and large. He took a step forwards round the altar, but as he did so, the vision disappeared, the lights shot up into a flare and went out. The house seemed to be suddenly shaken, in the darkness he heard the rattle of bones and the clash of metal, and Anthony fell all his length upon the ground and lay as one dead. But while he thus lay, there came to him in some secret cell of the mind a dreadful vision, which he could only dimly remember afterwards with a fitful horror. He thought that he was walking in the cloister of some great house or college, a cool place, with a pleasant garden in the court. He paced up and down, and each time that he did so, he paused a little before a great door at the end, a blind portal, with much carving about it, which he somehow knew he was forbidden to enter. Nevertheless, each time that he came to it, he felt a strong wish, that constantly increased, to set foot therein. Now in the dream there fell on him a certain heaviness, and the shadow of a cloud fell over the court, and struck the sunshine out of it. At last he made up his mind that he would enter. He pushed the door open with much difficulty, and found himself in a long, blank passage, very damp and chilly, but with a glimmering light. He walked a few paces down it. The flags underfoot were slimy, and the walls steamed with damp. He then thought that he would return, 
but the great door was closed behind him, and he could not open it. This made him very fearful, and while he considered what he should do, he saw a tall and angry-looking man approaching very swiftly down the passage. As he turned to face him, the other came straight to him and asked him very sternly what he did there, to which Anthony replied that he had found the door open, to which the other replied that it was fast now and that he must go forward. He seized Anthony as he spoke by the arm and urged him down the passage. Anthony would fain have resisted, but he felt like a child in the grip of a giant and went forward in great terror and perplexity. Presently they came to a door in the side of the wall, and as they passed it, there stepped out an ugly shadowy thing, the nature of which he could not clearly discern, and marched softly behind them. Soon they came to a turn in the passage, and in a moment the way stopped on the brink of a dark well that seemed to go down a long way into the earth, and out of which came a cold fetid air with a hollow sound like a complaining voice. Anthony drew back as far as he could from the pit and set his back to the wall, his companion letting go of him but he could not go backward, for the thing behind him was in the passage and barred the way, creeping slowly nearer. Then Anthony was in a great agony of mind and waited for the end. But while he waited, there came someone very softly down the passage and drew near, and the other, who had led him to the place, waited as though ill-pleased to be interrupted. It was too murky for Anthony to see the newcomer, but he knew in some way that he was a friend. The stranger came up to them, and spoke in a low voice to the man who had drawn Anthony thither, as though pleading for something. And the man answered angrily, but yet with a certain dark respect, and seemed to argue that he was acting in his right, and might not be interfered with. Anthony could not hear what they said, they spoke so low, but he guessed the sense, and knew that it was himself of which they discoursed, and listened with a fearful wonder to see which would prevail. The end soon came, for the tall man, who had brought him there, broke out into a great storm of passion, and Anthony heard him say, He hath yielded himself to his own will, and he is mine here, so let us make an end. Then the stranger seemed to consider, and then with a quiet courage, and in a soft and silvery voice like that of a child, said, I would that you would have yielded to my prayer, but as you will not, I have no choice." and he took his hand from under the cloak that wrapped him, and held something out. Then there came a great roaring out of the pit, and a zigzag flame flickered in the dark. Then in a moment the tall man and the shadow were gone. Anthony could not see whither they went, and he would have thanked the stranger, but the other put his finger to his lip, as though to order silence, and pointed to the way he had come, saying, Make haste and go back, for they will return anon with others, and you know not how dear it hath cost me. Anthony could see the stranger's face in the gloom, and he was surprised to see it so youthful. But he also saw that tears stood in the eyes of the stranger, and that something dark like blood trickled down his brow, yet he looked very lovingly at him. So Anthony made haste to go back and found the door ajar. But as he reached it, he heard a horrible din behind him, of cries and screams, and it was with a sense of gratitude that he could not put into words, but which filled all his heart, that he found himself back in the cloister again. And then the vision all fled away, and with a shock coming to himself, he found that he was lying in his own room, and then he knew that a battle had been fought out over his soul, and that the evil had not prevailed. He was cold and aching in every limb. The room was silent and dark, with the heavy smell of the burnt drugs all about it. Anthony crept to the door, and opened it, locked it again, and made his way in the dark very feebly to his bedchamber. He had just the strength to get into his bed, and then all his life seemed to ebb from him, and he lay, and thought that he was dying. Presently from without there came the crying of cocks, and a bell beat the hour of four, and after that, in his vigil of weakness, it was strange to see the light glimmer in the crevices, and to hear the awakening birds that in the garden bushes took up, one after the other, their slender piping song, till all the choir cried together. But Anthony felt a strange peace in his heart, and he had a sense, though he could not say why, that it was as once in his childhood when he was ill, and his mother had sat softly by him while he slept. So he waited, and in spite of his mortal weakness, that was a blessed hour. When his man came to rouse him in the morning, Anthony said that he believed he was very ill, that he had had a fall, and that the old doctor must be fetched to him. The man looked so strangely upon him 
that Anthony knew that he had some fear upon his mind. Presently the doctor was brought, and Anthony answered such questions as were put to him, in a faint voice, saying, I was late at my work, and I slipped and fell. The doctor, who looked troubled, gave directions, and when he went away, he heard his man behind the door asking the doctor about the strange storm in the night that had seemed like an earthquake, or as if a thunderbolt had struck the house. But the doctor said very gruffly, It is no time to talk thus, when your master is sick to death. But Anthony knew in himself that he would not die yet. It was long ere he was restored to a measure of health, and indeed he never rightly recovered the use of his limbs. The doctor held that he had suffered some stroke of palsy, at which Anthony smiled a little and made no answer. When he was well enough to creep to and fro, he went sadly to the dark room, and with much pain and weakness carried the furniture out of it. The picture he cut in pieces and burnt, and the candles and dishes, with the book, he cast into a deep pool in the stream. The bones he buried in the earth. The hangings he stored away for his own funeral. Anthony never entered his workroom again, but day after day he sat in his chair and read a little, but mostly in the Bible. He made a friend of a very wise old priest, to whom he opened all his heart, and to whom he conveyed much money to be bestowed upon the poor. There was a great calm in his spirit, which was soon written on his face, in spite of his pain, for he often suffered sorely. But he told the priest that something, he knew not certainly what, seemed to dwell by him, waiting patiently for his coming, and so Anthony awaited his end. The End